You're listening to the Empowering Process Podcast with your host, Gail Kraft. Listen as she holds frank discussions around how your purpose, being present, and trusting your power impacts your life. Whether you're an entrepreneur, leader, or developing your vision, you'll find wisdom and insights you can utilize right now. Welcome your host, Gail Kraft. Well, hello, everybody. This is Gail Kraft from the Empowering Process Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. I have with me a very special guest and a pretty amazing woman, and this is Sandy Rosenthal, right? Yay! And Sandy is going to share her story of some action she took and in the process discovered just how pretty amazing she is. Welcome, Sandy. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to this. It's going to be so much fun. So we're going to take you back in history. And for those of you who don't remember, look it up, right? Back in the day when um, Katrina wiped out New Orleans. And it was quite a devastating experience. It took the country a long time to, um, to recover. New Orleans, I don't think, ever really totally recovered. And Sandy, you were there. And what happened with you was that finger pointing occurred and finger pointing was in the wrong direction. And rather than sit back and allow it to happen, you got your knickers in a twitty (laughs) and you took action. So let's talk a little bit about what it was like when Katrina hit. And then the aftermath of accusations that were unfounded and what that meant for you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you again for having me on the show. The finger pointing, as you call it, well, it's a great way to describe it, started immediately. It started um, when there was still water in the city. It started when they didn't even have all the bodies counted. Immediately, fingers were pointed and you realize this is a is an, an engineering disaster that took place in like 50 different levee breaches. It, it would be years before the investigations were complete. The, you know, I'm sure everyone remembers the Challenger disaster uh, when the, uh, the, the, uh, the Challenger ship b- blew up w- within sight of us. Right. And the, uh, it took many months, many, many months to even crack the surface on what really happened. So disasters or catastrophes of this size takes months, if not years, to figure out what happened. But in, in a week, the finger pointing began. And the finger pointing was at us, the people who live here, um, the people who this was our home. We were called imbeciles for living here and stupid for wanting to come home and rebuild. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Mm -hmm. first of all, explain to people what a levy is, because those of us who don't live in that area might not completely understand what that's all about. Thank you for reminding me about that. I forget that not everybody lives near levees. Uh, 62% of the American population does live in counties protected by levees, but they probably don't think about it. And why should they? Um, These levees are often built by the federal government. They're supposed to work. We assume that they work. We never drive across a federal bridge and worry, oh, will it hold? It's certainly not in the country of America. (laughs) So, but a levee is a, um, it's actually usually earthen. It's made of earth. It's a structure. Um, different from a building, but it's a structure like a building. And we all expected our levees would work when we heard that a hurricane was coming to New Orleans. Um, those with a car and credit cards got out. Uh, those that didn't have those things stayed, which was about um, 100,000 people. And uh, many of them didn't survive. Right. The, uh, there was uh, 1,400 deaths within a few hours. 80% of the city flooded. It was the most costly engineering catastrophe in the history of the United States. Right. And so the purpose of a levee is similar to a dam and that it holds back the ocean in this the water, right? It holds back the water from coming when there is a hurricane, when there is maybe even a tsunami. So you expect that it's a safe environment. We all expected it was a safe environment. Nobody in their wildest dreams ever thought 
these levees could break. Sure, we expected there might have been some inconvenient flooding. That's what we call it here in New Orleans. That's when you get a little overtopping of the levees or when you get some street flooding mm -hmm. um, with some drains don't work. That's called inconvenient flooding. And as the word it, it describes, you know, it's inconvenient, but we, you know, we uh, sometimes we have to pull out some wet rugs and replace them, but doesn't happen often. But we can live with that. But what happened uh, when the levees broke? Uh, 1,400 people dead within a few hours, a um, 100,000 people, um, no, excuse me, a million people displaced. A lot of people still haven't come home. And that was almost 18 years ago. So it was a bona fide catastrophe, uh, the worst engineering disaster in the world, uh, second only to Ch Chernobyl. So the finger point had started. And because I was in a unique place, I was in a unique place because my husband told me uh, the day before Katrina arrived to pack for three weeks. And then we got in the car and drove out. Pack for three weeks, he said. And the reason he told me that is because he had been living in New Orleans when Hurricane Betsy came through exactly 40 years earlier. And he remembered months without electricity, months without a phone, months without ice. Pack for three weeks, he said. And I did. And and then I we left town. We w watched on TV like everyone else did. We watched the levees break. We saw the people on the rooftops and we quickly found out that my house didn't flood. So here I was. Uh, my house didn't flood. I didn't have to deal with FEMA, a contractor, an insurance company. And I packed for three weeks. So I had had all the comforts of home living in a hotel. I remembered my checkbook. I remembered the, I even bought brought some framed pictures, if you can Just believe in case, that. Right. Right. So I was in a unique place and I I took advantage of that unique place to read, to listen to the radio, to watch TV. Remember, this is 18 years ago. We were still watching the news on TV. Mm -hmm. And uh, I very quickly formed my own version of events. And that was that this was the federal government's fault because they are the ones responsible for building our levees and our levees broke. When if in my mind, if a if a brand new building fell to the ground, you wouldn't blame the janitor. You'd blame the designer of the building and the contractor and the engineer. And in the case of levees, the Army Corps, all three of those things. So I started mobilizing the community to fight back and to fight that narrative that this was our fault and that we were stupid for living here. And I found a person in me I didn't know existed. <laughs> I had no idea that I was actually pretty good at mobilizing people as I, I had no idea until the levees broke. And if the levees hadn't broken, I, st I still wouldn't know to this day. Right. So what was what was some of the action that you needed to take? Because I'm sure it wasn't just, no, you're wrong, and then it's over with, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. So um, the first thing I did is I had to create a mission, and that is education about why New Orleans flooded. And then uh, I thought, well, let's create a website. And my son, who was 15 years old, had just turned 15 years old at the time, volunteered to do that. Now, kids know everything these days. So he <laughs> created a website and I created a mission. But then I thought, well, we need more than that. Keep in mind, I wasn't living in New Orleans yet. I was still evacuated and living in a town uh, three hours from, from New Orleans. I thought, I know we need members. We need members. And so I wrote a petition to President Bush asking him to keep his promise to build back New Orleans levees bigger and stronger. And I circulated the petition to my family and friends. And overnight, boom, we had 200 signers of the petition. And so those were our members. And that was my first taste of any sort of community mobilization, you know, mm -hmm. to make the world a better place. And I found out that uh, it was uh, actually kind of fun. Um, making something happen, doing something. And I put that to use uh, with um, the first thing we did is we held a rally at the Army Corps of Engineers headquarters, you know, demanding that our levees be rebuilt properly and continuing to focus the attention on the Army Corps of Engineers, not monster storm, you know, city below the sea or, or certainly anything that local official did or did not do. The the 100 percent culprit in the flooding of New Orleans is our federal government, also called the Army Corps of Engineers. And so you're right. It didn't happen overnight. It took it took many different um, uh, different campaigns that we did. We, we wrote letters to members of Congress. We pushed for reform of the Army Corps of Engineers uh, and one very um, 
very, very well-known thing that we did. We caught the Army Corps of Engineers sitting at their computers um, um, harassing us online, you know, putting vicious comments about and my son online. We caught them at it using their computers, using something called an IP address, which is kind of like a caller ID on a phone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we caught them red-handed. Well, turns out there's no law um, this preventing the Army Corps, the people who are supposed to be protecting us. There's no law that says they can't do that. But when they were caught, it was very embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, the damage to their goodwill is is infinite. They, they still, to this day, people still talk about it. Right. And that's something for your listeners to know. Um, even though some things are not illegal, if you're caught, it looks really, really bad. Right. So, so this is, this was, I was at the age of 48 years old. I had no idea that I had any skills whatsoever in doing this kind of work, you know, mobilizing people, get, getting their attention and then getting them to do something, be it send a letter, make a phone call, show up at an event. So, um, so the levees have been rebuilt and rebuilt yes. differently. Yes, um, they, they have been rebuilt. The one thing that Congress did do immediately is they did give the Army Corps of Engineers uh, a big pile of money and said, go build, rebuild the levees and do it right this time. Right. Very good. No, they should have been built that way before Katrina arrived. And yes, we can now say we have a shiny new system that we should have had in the first place. That's true. Right. Right. But For I sure. couldn't rest until I knew that the entire country knows the real reason that New Orleans flooded, that the the survivors deserve it. Absolutely. And and honestly, um, so we made a mistake, right? Own it, fix it. I and mean, that honestly is the one lesson I had very young in business. I can remember my first major mess up in a company. And my boss came over to it and he went, you effed up, you know, yelling at me, right? And I went, yes, I did. He said, Okay, so how do we fix it? That was it. How do we fix it? Right? Do you own Own it? Own up and and then fix it. Right? And the Army Corps of Engineers did not own up. And they spent millions trying to fool Congress and fool the American people and harassing me because I was out there with the, not just me, but me and my group, levy.org, because we had the story right. Mm -hmm. And the Army Corps almost got away with it. Oh, see the Almost. details of my book. All of the details are in my book. If anyone right. would like to read it, I will say this. I want to point out I'm proud of this. Uh, most of the people who read my book say it's a page turner. Ah, see, there you go. So we'll definitely a have textbook. a link to the book. It's on Amazon. It, it is on Amazon.com. OK, so we'll Word have a link in water. Ah, I love it. Love mm. it. So um that was a while ago. What are you doing now? And what has that taught you? Well, we're about to unveil uh, tomorrow. Um, so by the time this airs, I it'll think be, it'll be in the yeah. past. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you about it. Yeah. So, so um, my organization noticed that there was no style guide for Hurricane Katrina. And a style guide is is a guide that journalists use whenever they talk about something. Mm -hmm. And there is a style guide for 9-11. There is a style guide for the Titanic disaster. My organization noticed that as of a year ago, there was still no style guide for Hurricane Katrina. So we approached the Associated Press, which has a style guide, a thick one. I have a copy of it right here. And and pointed it out to them that there was no style guide on how to discuss the events of Katrina in New Orleans, which is where the levees were. Sure, Hurricane Katrina hit Mississippi with a big surge, but in New Orleans, it was levee failure. The Associated Press agreed and issued a new style guide, and my organization is going to announce this news tomorrow on the eve of hurricane season in New Orleans. Uh (laughs) See, so you're still very much active in being sure that all of the information about levees and all of the safety um, concerns for people living in New Orleans and places like that are addressed. That's correct. The, the major media has the story right. The New York Times, the Associated Press, the, um, the Los Angeles Times, the Houston Chronicle, the major media, they know the story and they properly speak of the events. 
Um, it's been now almost 18 years. But there's a lot of people that are still clinging to that fairy tale because that's what they heard. That's what they heard, you know, that week that people were on their roofs for a week. When my brother finally got through to me, you know, cell phones didn't work right. uh, for months. Okay. Right. And if they did, it was spotty. When my brother finally got through to me, I was in Lafayette. And I, I, my brother, who was a fireman at the time, he's retired now. He said, Sandy, can I come help? <laughs> That's a fireman for you. And, and I said, I said, well, no, thanks. You know, the best thing you can do is help uh, uh, evacuees that are coming to Massachusetts and they will be coming. I said, but Mike, I said, have you been watching this much on te television? <laughs> and my brother said, Sandy, it's all we do up here. Everybody is glued to the television set 24 seven watching what's going on in New Orleans. Right. And I went, really? Because we we were cut off. We were cut off from humanity. Uh, down wow, here. Wow. Right. Hopefully you don't even last... think. Right. I can remember during that time, um, I was a contractor. Um, uh, I was doing this, but I was doing contract work. And the contract that I had at the time was with a uh, big health insurance company in San Diego. And they were they were mobilizing the whole state, mobilized, bringing doctors together, you know, almost like Doctors Without Borders to start sending help and, and having a circulation go so the doctors would go and then and fresh crew ready to go as they come back. Very involved in sending as much help as they possibly could without impacting the services that they were providing locally. Volunteers was what got us through this. Yeah. Volunteers it should get should get the biggest shout out um, for what happened. Uh, I also do want to point out that hopefully that's the last time that an entire metropolitan city is completely cut off from the rest of the world. Hopefully that's the last time. Yeah. So being cut off. So that's we are so uh, accustomed to our connectivity that we don't really understand. I mean, I don't remember not ever having a, a phone connection or a television for information or a radio, right? Never mind. So the internet for me came later, but still at this point, I am so accustomed to have my phone. If I want to look something up, I look it up immediately. I don't have to write it down. And when I get home, I'll look it up. Information is so available right now, and it doesn't take much to bring that down. It didn't, although we learned a lot uh, yeah. after the events of, of the levee breach in, uh, event in 2005. A lot of organizations have completely rethought the way they do their emergency supplies, right. their emergency plans, uh, and national policy. Lots of laws were changed in America, and I mentioned not one in specific. Many people refused to evacuate ahead of Katrina because they were told they couldn't bring their pets. So people would stay with their pets and perish with them. Right. So right. a law was passed. FEMA passed, the uh, Congress passed a law that this tells states, if you do not make accommodations for pets, you can't apply for FEMA assistance. And again, this wasn't about the pets. Now, I'm a dog owner. I've got a sleeping dog right behind me right now. But it wasn't about the pets. It was about the pet owners. Right. Because right. for these pet owners, their pets were their family. Well, hello. <laughs> Right. I post pictures of my cat and my dog. Right. Mm -hmm. They're family. Mm -hmm. they, They're family. They matter. Right. You don't leave them behind. Right. Of course not. Of course not. Of course not. So um, so very interesting. There's so much about that. Um, so many shades and, and nuances about that whole experience and and um, and what went on as far as, you know, who showed up, who didn't show up. When were funds made available? How long did it take? I mean, why were people on their roofs for weeks? I mean, it was ridiculous. Understanding, yes, the water didn't recede, but still, why were, were we not able to mobilize more quickly? Walmart made it here with water, but um, FEMA did not. And I, I, I go into these details about why this happened in my book. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a reason um, the, the number one reason was probably Red October. Red October was a communication system. It was a truck, basically a truck that had cell towers that could have been cranked up, brought into town and cranked up. But what happened is um, Michael Brown ordered the, the truck Red October to be brought in and someone else canceled it. 
And so what hap- happened is the truck ne- didn't make it to New Orleans until a week later. So no and it was during that time that we were with, totally without communication. Right. Uh, and and it, the rumors were rampant. The rumors, the, the only communication was rumors. I can tell and, you when I was younger, um, I had a sister who lived in L.A. during the, um, the major earthquake. And again, everything was gone. Everything was down. And I was calling, trying to find out if she was alive or dead, her and my niece, what's going on. And I ended up having to go through the Red Cross to have them track her down to find out where she was to know that she was safe. And it took a week Mm -hmm. before I got news back. About what year was that approximately? Um, I want to say that was, was that in the 90s? I think that Uh was in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. And before cell phones and um yeah there was no it wasn't just there well I don't know oh they might have been just starting no I think I had a common. cell phone I think I had a cell phone she mm-hmm. might not have right but I'm I'm pretty sure because as soon as cell phones came out I got rid of my landline and got a cell phone <laughs> right um so I I've had one forever uh but you don't realize how when there's lack of communication and you're in the blind on both sides, right? How do you make choices without details and information? Right. It, I mean, the do only I thing you could do is rely do on go? the rumors that you heard. And they were wrong. And they were wrong. They were often wrong. Right. Often wrong. And then the media, uh, the, 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 I talk about this in the, my book as well. The media would repeat these stories as, a, as though they were vetted fact which is absolutely you know, for, forbidden for the media to do that. And, and the media actually, Congress actually um, criticized the media uh, in, in the hearings afterward. Uh, mm-hmm. The media got a big, big slap from Congress for its, for its shoddy reporting. I don't know if those were the exact words. Right. So the, the media is partly to blame. The uh, again, hopefully at the last time we get such a disaster, because when the Associated Press issued it's it's style guide alert, which which my organization will, will announce tomorrow on May 31st. When the Associated Press issued that, they made a point. They said, we live in a day of advance warning of hurricanes. We knew a week in advance that Hurricane Katrina was on its way. And still we had this amount of death and destruction, which mm-hmm. is just there's there's no excuse. Right. Galveston was different. Galveston was 1900, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, we had we didn't have early warnings that they didn't know the hurricane was coming. I mean, the death toll from Galveston was much higher. It's a diff, but that was a different world. There, right. There's no reason that in the 21st century we should have had such a disaster. Right. And that's one of the that's one of the things that fuels me. It keeps me going. This well, shouldn't have happened. The survivors deserve to, for everyone to know what really did happen. And, and that how a major uh, federal organization spent a lot of government money uh, bamboozling the American people and Congress. And there's so many life stories in this story, right? And the life stories such as everything is a story. What story are you hearing? Get curious. Ask more questions. Ask mm. more questions. Don't take anything at face value, no matter what it is. Right. Because our beliefs are molded by outside forces. Use your inside force to formulate your own belief because you got curious. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Something's not right here. And Mm -hmm. you got curious and investigated. Right. One hundred percent. Right. Right. That's Mm -hmm. all. Look, it took one woman to get curious and say, wait a minute. This doesn't seem right. (laughs) Right. Imagine what would happen in the world if if people actually trusted their gut. And said, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right. And it didn't take a lot. Yes, you had to mobilize people, but look at how easily you did that. Once one person opens up their mouth, others follow. Right, right. So um, congratulations to you. I think that's fantastic, right? You found a calling that, you know, is so, so important, right? Um, And laws, procedures have been changed because of it. People are safer because of it. People are wiser because of it, right? And that's the most important thing. Information is power. Two thirds of the American population lives in counties by levees. That is huge, Mm -hmm. huge. I wonder if we could map that out. 
Well, there is a map of it yeah. on my, my website. Okay. Levy.org. Okay. So it's levy.org. And again, that'll be in the show notes. So people will be able to go and check it out. Right. Just to know, you know, would you move? Of course not. You love your home. You love your community and you trust, right. As the people in new Orleans did that the levees are safe. So I'm curious, I'm wondering if the levees, the other levees have been inspected and upgraded since. In, in other states? Yes. Well, it's interesting that you say that. Um, when after the disaster in 2005 here in New Orleans, California stood up and took note. California has more people in danger of levee failure due, due to salt and, and then the resulting salt water intrusion than Texas, Louisiana and Mississippi combined. And California put a billion dollars of its own money into making sure that its levees are, are in ship shape. Right. So right. that's California. And Texas is also a state that's heavily reliant on levees. And but so is Washington, D.C. Right, because it's on the ocean. And we found out um, because of Hurricane Sandy, a superstorm Sandy, um, so does New York City. Uh -huh. See, see. Mm -hmm. So um, so I I did a road trip up and down the West Coast one year. I flew up to Washington, rented a car and drove all the way down to San Diego and stopped. And it was the ocean trip that I took. And there are many places, you know, in Oregon and especially Northern California, where you have tsunami warnings. There, there, there are notes about, you know, listen for the tsunami war warnings, right? Because earthquakes on, in the water are going to create a tsunami. And earthquakes don't happen just on land, right? That's so, correct. Yeah. Yep. So and Hawaii has tsunami awesome. warnings every, I don't know about every, they test their system once a week. Right. So, mm -hmm. so in Hawaii, come on guys, it's, it's a mountaintop <laughs> and the mountain happens to be a bunch of volcanoes. Right. And so you're going to tell the people in Hawaii why they're fools for living there. Of course not. Of course not. Right. Right. And so, that actually happened, by the way, there, there's a famous the Speaker of the House uh, is famously quoted as saying they should just bulldoze New Orleans. Uh, at the time, this was this was 2005. How nice. So, so, yeah. Can you imagine that? I, that's what really m put me to action. I was mad. You no know, anger. You and know, I, there, I there are parts of this country where there's magic. And New Orleans is one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I would totally agree. I live here and I see it every day. Right. Why would you say that about a place where, where you can feel the magic emanating from there? Are you kidding me? <laughs> right. So, Sandy, what would you, your, your parting words be to people, you know, about your experience and what they can take away from this and in, in changing their lives? My my takeaway is even in even in the middle of a catastrophe, there, there's silver linings, there's ways in which people um, can improve to find, discover people inside themselves that they didn't know was there. Uh, one quick anecdotal is my son had severe shin splints and we, we, we evacuated to Lafayette and our next door neighbor happened to be a physical therapist and he offered to treat my son and basically cured his shin splint. I thought my son would never run again. Mm -hmm. And this next door neighbor, and this is we we discussed this in my book, um, figured out what was wrong, and just by create putting an orthotic in a shoe, my my fifteen year old could run and jump again. He was he was essentially um, he could only walk and only on soft surfaces. So that that's an outcome of the event that that was good for my family and my son. So look for the positive, uh, e even when even when it even when things don't look good, even when they look bleak, because as they say, it's always darkest just before the sun rises. That's true. That's absolutely true. And honestly, you know, um, there's, a, there's always, I hate the saying with a silver lining, but what happened because of that event, yes, awful lives, you know, were lost, but miracles again happened because Things got motivated, things got to move, things got to change because one woman spoke up 
And I'm so happy to have the opportunity to speak to that one woman and interview her on this podcast. So Sandy, thank you so much. And again, guys, this is Gail Craft from the Empowering Process Podcast. If you enjoyed this and you know something came up, let us know, give us a thumbs up and give us a comment. If you know someone who could maybe learn something from this, share it out. And as always, please do subscribe because then you'll know when there's another episode coming up. This is Gail Craft saying bye-bye and thank you so much. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you for listening to the Empowering Process Podcast. Be sure to visit Gail at gailcraft.com. To learn more about how she serves thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and goal seekers. And remember, if you like this broadcast, be sure to share and subscribe so you don't miss an episode.